Welcome to the Transforming Anxiety Podcast with Life Coach Kelly Hanlon McCormick. This is episode number 12. Hey there, welcome. I'm so glad you're here today. We are going into the second pillar of my system to freedom from anxiety, and it's all about habits today. So last week we focused on mindset, and for the record, I truly believe that pillar to be the most powerful information for people. For whatever reason, we don't pull people aside in school or make them take a course in high school where they learn how to clean up their minds. It's wild to me. But anyway, that's what we do here. (laughs) And I'm thrilled to be with you today. So we've covered mindset. And next week in episode number 13, we're going to focus on lifestyle. But today we're going into habits. Habits are the bridge between mindset and lifestyle. Habits are what makes this easy. So I'm kind of a nerd about habits. I think habits are fascinating because habits are the daily routines that we practice. And when you think about it, habits make up a large part of what you do every single day. They are little things like brushing your teeth and the order in which you go through your morning routines. Like, have you ever noticed um, little things that, that you do? Like, I always make my boys lunches and then I do their snacks and then I do their water bottles. Why? (laughs) I don't know. Just my habit. I just find these little idiosyncrasies interesting. They're teeny tiny, but they're also enormous. And one of the tricky parts of habits is that since it's something you do once every day, or maybe it's once a week or whatever the time frame looks like, it doesn't ever seem like it's that big of a deal. It's easy to fall into the, well, one time doesn't really matter thought trap. But habits aren't interesting because of the one thing you did on Tuesday, right? Habits are so interesting and they're so important because what you do on Tuesday, you actually do every single weekday, which means you do it about 250 times each year. I don't care how small that habit is. If you do something 250 times a year, it's going to add up to something. So when I first started coaching, I coached mainly around mindset because, again, that was the newest information. It was the most exciting and the most groundbreaking stuff that I had to offer my clients. And then as I was really moving into tweaking my programs and working with more and more clients, I started to realize that I really needed to address the lifestyle piece that we're going to talk about next week. And for years, I focused on those two things only, mindset and lifestyle. And then in 2015, Gretchen Rubin came out with a book called Better Than Before, which is all about mastering the habits of our everyday lives. And like the nerdy, introverted person that I am, I spent most of my birthday that year (laughs) reading that book, and I had this huge aha moment. This was such a huge piece in the whole picture of living our very best lives, this whole habits thing. Now, I want to be clear on one thing before we get into this. I firmly believe mindset is queen in this whole system. When your mind is clean and clear, you can accomplish whatever you're setting out to do, including things like habits and lifestyle elements. So that said, for me personally and for my clients, I have found that it's really helpful to break this system out into these three pieces because our minds like to wrap around systems and I'm all about making this easy. So mindset is key. That's the most important thing. But this is a close second. So back to habits. Gretchen Rubin helpfully lays out this framework in the beginning of her book called The Four Tendencies. And I like to think of the four tendencies as the gateway into habits, because I think this is helpful in gaining awareness for your starting point. This is a great tool for self-awareness. She treats these tendencies as so-called facts about who we are, but I like to just consider these as jumping off points. So if you've been listening along, you may recognize a fixed versus a growth mindset approach (laughs) to these tendencies, right? Go back to episode number 10 if you missed that little reference. But the tendencies are based on expectations. So as Ruben puts it, when we try to form a new habit, we set an expectation for ourselves. Therefore, it's crucial to understand how we respond to expectations. So, okay, there are internal expectations, 
Things like how you want to eat and exercise or your financial goals for your family. And there are external expectations. Things like a request from the boss or obeying traffic laws. And the four tendencies are based on how people handle both internal and external expectations. So see if you can identify yourself in one of these tendencies. These are the four tendencies. So first is the upholder. Upholders readily respond to both external and internal expectations. If there's an expectation on the table, they just rise to meet it without much struggle. There's no fuss about it. And because of that, upholders are extremely reliable people. Other people can rely on them and they can easily rely on themselves. That said, (laughs) upholders can be a tad stringent because they are such devout rule followers. So there's good and bad to this tendency, like with all of them. Okay, obligers are the next tendency. Obligers readily respond to external expectations, but have a hard time meeting their internal expectations. So if someone else wants them to do something, they'll rise to meet the request without any trouble. But getting themselves motivated to do something that they want to do for themselves, it's much, much trickier for obligers. Other people find them very reliable, but they don't necessarily trust themselves to get what they want or need to do done. So having external accountability is really helpful for obligers. So the next one is questioners. Questioners question all expectations, external and internal, but they rise to meet the expectations that they understand. They will do things if they make sense to them, not just because someone had asked them to do it or because they themselves want to do it. So I think this is interesting where habits are concerned because questioners will put themselves and their own wants and desires and their internal expectations through the same tests of logic and reason and fairness that they put external expectations through. So even if their own wants and desires are, you know, something that they consciously want to do, they must be sound and pass these tests in order to move them to action. So rebels are the last tendency. And rebels, as you may have guessed from the name, resist all expectations. It doesn't matter if it's an external request from a boss or a loved one, or whether it's something they really want to do for themselves. Expectations are just no good for a rebel. (laughs) Rebels thrive in the moment and they act based on what they want right now rather than what they know is best or what someone else has asked of them. So most people identify pretty strongly with one of the four tendencies. And like I said, I think this is a great tool in self-awareness. This is a jumping off point. How are you naturally coming into this work? What is easiest for you when your mind is just left to its own devices? Upholder, obliger, questioner, rebel. So just so you know, I'm a questioner for sure. This is just, you know, left to my own devices. If it makes sense, I'm all in. But I don't care whose expectation it is. If I can't wrap my head around the why behind it, I'm out. Now, as a coach with a strong growth mindset, I firmly believe your tendency is just that. It's a tendency. Your mind can be cleaned up and managed to create whatever you want. So remember, think of this as a starting off point. For myself, for instance, I think it's good to know that I default to questioner mode and I can catch myself asking why and making sure that whatever it is fully checks out with my own sense of logic and reason and fairness. But I can also coach myself. I can ask who I want to be in any given given situation or what I want to feel or how I want to act. I can check in with the model and clean up whatever needs to be cleaned up. I think it can get a little dangerous to just say, well, I'm a questioner, that's it, the end. And sometimes, you know, of course, it's not helpful for me to stay in questioner mode. So that's where I coach myself. That's where I get where I want to be. And that's what I want to offer you guys to use this as a starting point. And then remember all of those mindset tools. You can coach yourself to get where you want to be. So all of that said, you can check out her book, Better Than Before, for more on the four tendencies. And then she's got a whole um, framework around habits. 
Now, that said, James Clear recently wrote a book called Atomic Habits, and I am obsessed. (laughs) I think this is the third time in 12 episodes that I've mentioned it on the podcast, right? Which is sort of silly, but it's so good. So years ago, I read a book by Charles Duhigg called The Power of Habit, and it's a fascinating read. He uses awesome examples from huge corporations like Target and Starbucks to examine habits, and some of what he uncovered in his research (laughs) is kind of creepy. It's just startling how these big companies use consumer habits to advertise and to display things. It's amazing. So anyway, James Clear took that work and expanded on it by using what Duhigg had uncovered and laying out a whole habit making and habit breaking in a super simple four step process. And you know, I love a good step by step. So research shows that habits are based on a simple neurological feedback loop. And this loop runs in our brains based on triggers in our environment. So Clear's four laws of behavior change are based on what our brains go through when they're in this habit loop. This all happens unconsciously, that large part of our cognition that's hidden from conscious view. Habits are a completely unconscious process. In fact, that's the magic of habits. When they're working for you, your brain is just on autopilot and doesn't have to spend any effort or any energy doing what you want to be doing. So the four phases of the feedback loop are cue, craving, response, and reward. There's a cue that kicks your brain into gear and you begin craving something based on that cue. You respond to the craving and then you're rewarded, often with a good dose of dopamine from your brain, which just feeds into that loop and it sets that cue in place for the next time you come across that cue. So cue, craving, response, reward. Now Clear says, all behavior is driven by the desire to solve a problem. Sometimes the problem is that you notice something good and you want to obtain it. Sometimes the problem is that you are experiencing pain and you want to relieve it. Either way, the purpose of every habit is to solve the problems you face. So can you see how this is true when you consider your emotions? Your brain is in nonstop problem solving mode and you're working to solve the problem of chasing down good emotions and relieving bad emotions all the time. Kind of makes sense, right? So what's really cool is how he breaks this feedback loop into the four laws of behavior change. And this is really like the bulk of his book. He makes this so actionable. You ready? So the first law is make it obvious. The cue is what starts this feedback loop. So when you want to create a new good habit, you need to make the cue for this habit obvious. The harder you have to work to find the cue to kick off that good habit, the less likely your brain is going to just enter that feedback loop. So cue, make it obvious. Now next is the craving. And the key to that is to make it attractive. That's the second law of behavior change. Make it attractive. Lots of the good habits we want to cultivate require hard work from us. And if they didn't, right, we'd likely already just have the habit in place. We wouldn't be trying to create this habit. So in order to crave it, it's got to be attractive. Make it easy is the third law. So next in the loop is the response and the response has to be easy. I'm going to do an example here in just a second so we can show how all this goes together. But the more the, the more difficult that you perceive that response to be, the less likely you are to make a real habit out of it. So the response has to be easy. And then the reward. Okay, now this may seem like a no-brainer, but the reward has to be satisfying, which is the final law of behavior change. Make it satisfying. So cue, craving, response, reward. Make it obvious. Make it attractive. Make it easy. Make it satisfying. So like I said, let's take a quick, quick example and just see how this works in real life. So consider getting up to practice yoga every morning. This is one of my favorite habits for my personal life. So the cue is 5 a.m. That's when I get up to practice yoga. 
Time and location are really great cues. Plus, they're pretty obvious, which is the key to making the cue set, right? So cue equals time. Make it obvious. Done. Now, the craving has to be attractive. It's an anticipation of the reward. This is based on dopamine, of course, because that's how the brain operates, right? So cravings are when you're wanting a dopamine hit. So I'm wanting to be stronger, more flexible. I want to feel emotionally calm and centered. And I also want to be physically fit and healthy. Plus, I want to look good. Let's just be honest. So I crave all of these things and my daily yoga practice answers those cravings. Yoga for me is a far more attractive way to answer those cravings than something like going running or lifting weights. So the craving is attractive to me. Good. Okay, now the response, the yoga practice itself. This has to be easy. And for me, what's easiest in this season of my life while I still have young kids at home is practicing before anyone else wakes up and practicing at home. It's much easier for me to just go downstairs than it is for me to find a couple hours in my day to get to a yoga studio. So I have my mat in a handy spot. I have my yoga clothes laid out the night before. These are just little things that make the obstacles from waking up to getting on my mat pretty much nil. So the response, practicing yoga is easy, right? Done. Now, the reward, the reward must be satisfying. So I know how I feel after a yoga practice. And after years of doing this, I know how healthy and strong and flexible and fit I am largely because of my yoga practice. So rewards are something to be developed over time because immediate gratification helps to set a a habit in place when it's new. But ultimately, it's the marathon. It's that delayed gratification that's truly life-changing. So at any rate, I get the reward for my yoga practice in the short term because I'm feeling like my body is opened up and I'm stretched, I'm ready for the day. And in the long term, because I'm seeing the cumulative results of years of practice at this point. So the reward is definitely satisfying. So again, cue, craving, response, reward, make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, make it satisfying. Pretty simple, right? (laughs) All right, you've got to check out the book Atomic Habits by James Clear and just read into the details of all this. It's so good. So, you know, I love to create a little freebie for you. And this week's downloadable worksheet is a habits cheat sheet. It's just a great reference guide for creating and breaking habits. (laughs) We didn't talk about that too much, but it includes the four tendencies from Gretchen Rubin, and it also includes the four laws of behavior change from James Clear, how to both create, like I said, and break habits. We didn't really have time to go into breaking bad habits, but of course, we can all appreciate how important it is to not only cultivate the good habits, but also to get rid of maybe old or bad habits that just aren't working for us or aren't working for us anymore. So all of that's listed in the cheat sheet. Just go to kellyhanlonmccormick.com slash podcast slash 12 to grab that. So now think of a habit you want to create, something new that you know would be a good addition to your life. Maybe it's something like meditating or cooking dinner instead of always getting takeout or saving more money. Whatever it is, whether it's something small or something big, just pick something and start putting it into this framework. See if you can identify your tendency, your, this is your jumping off point, and see what is easiest for you when your mind is left to its own devices, right? Upholder, obliger, questioner, or rebel. That's just what's most natural to you. That's what happens when your mind is on default, right? Then see if you can identify the cue craving, response, and reward. And just see if you can pinpoint what would need to happen in order to create this new habit. So you can see this is the part where having a super clean mind (laughs) and working through the model, doing thought downloads, challenging your beliefs, challenging your tendency, right? All that good stuff is going to come in handy, right? All of these things work together. These pillars are a system. They're not little islands. 
But also, guys, let me know how it's going. I'd love to hear from you. You can DM me on Instagram. I'm at McCormick, Or you can find me on Facebook, Kelly Hanlon McCormick. Or better yet, book a free mini session with me. Let's talk through your habit work together. So to do that, go to kellyhanlonmccormick.com slash coaching and you can book a free 15 minute mini session with me. Let's do this. Okay, that's it for today. So the bridge between mindset and lifestyle, the glue that sends all of this from our conscious effort-filled thinking to our unconscious autopilot cognition is habits. Habits are the second pillar of my system for freedom from anxiety. And this is such an important thing to not only understand, but to master. Mastering habit creation takes what you have learned from the other pillars like mindset and lifestyle, which we'll get to next week, and it just cements them. It makes it so much easier and smoother to live your best life. Good stuff. So folks, have a wonderful week and I will see you next time. Until then, take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Transforming Anxiety Podcast with Kelly McCormick. For more information, you can go to www.kellyhanlonmccormick.com. Music is by Jesse Blake. The song is Ritual, and you can find out more about him at www.jesseblakemusic.com.